done for your life. And let me remind you, I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor their seed begging bread. If you've got a reason to shout hallelujah this morning, give him the best hallelujah that you can give him today. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Come on, give him a better hallelujah than that. Praise you, Lord. Ray, this morning I'm grateful. I'm grateful because you and I have way much more than what we deserve. I'm grateful this morning, Angel, because despite our struggles, God's been faithful. He's never left us alone. We have never been forsaken. Sister Anita, we've never been in the dark without help, but he's always been our most present help in time of need, and I've never gone without. I've never suffered, and when I've suffered, he's always been there to pick me up and turn me around and take me where I need to go. Let's give him one more hallelujah this morning. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Father, this morning we just sing hallelujah. We are grateful because, God, we are unworthy. Lord, we don't deserve anything of what you have bestowed upon us. Lord, we even the most righteous individual this morning, Lord, our righteousness is as filthy rags in your sight. And, Lord, we don't deserve the goodness of an almighty, perfect God. But we thank you, Lord, that you've given us your goodness. We thank you, Lord, that we have all these amenities plus more. We have all of our needs plus most of our wants. And, Lord, today, we just sing hallelujah. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity, God. Don't let us take for granted this gathering together of the brethren. Don't let us take for granted, Lord, this opportunity to come into the house of the Lord and receive the bread of life, Father. Lord, today we're thankful for the church. We're thankful for each other. We're thankful, Lord, even in those difficult moments, Lord, we have a firm assurance, a hope as an anchor that, Lord, what is shall not always be, but that there is a next season for our life. And Lord, that even in the midst of our this season, even in the midst of our difficulty, you've been faithful and you have seen us through every valley. So today, Lord, we say hallelujah. And we thank you, Lord, for this day and for what you're about to do. Holy Spirit, I thank you for the anointing and I thank you, Lord, for what I feel now. And Lord, I pray that this same anointing, that this same feeling, that this same power that is present in this worship moment, Lord, as we transition from worship in song to worship in the word, that the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit will remain so that the bread of life can be broken and that so your people can have ears to hear and hearts to receive what the, what the Lord is saying through the word today. Father, today anoint the vessels of clay to receive the perfect word of God. We thank you for what you're going to do in our lives and in our service today. In the name of Jesus' righteous name we pray. And the church said, amen and amen. Love on somebody before you're seated and children's church can be dismissed this morning with Sister Maddie. God bless you. Sit down if you're able. Amen. <clears throat> Aren't you glad to be able to gather with one another? Aren't you grateful? And, and, and such a, almost a full house. I know it may not seem like it to most of you, but a year ago our pews weren't near as full as what they are now. And we're still missing folks. What I tell you, God was going to do some great things, and I believe we're about to step into that. And this morning we're going to continue to talk about some things and I'm going to kind of piggyback off of last week's sermon. And if you weren't here last week, just let me, allow me the liberty to remind you of what we discussed last week at the first of the year I felt led to preach a sermon called After This. And the whole purpose of this sermon, of this after this, was to let you know that whatever season, whatever difficulty, whatever, whatever problem you're facing, there is an after. 
Whatever this season is, whatever, whatever problems you faced in 2022, whatever, whatever valley you had to trek through in the last year, whatever it is that you are currently struggling with, there is an after to that problem. There is something greater on the way. There is a season of peace. There's a season of comfort. And there's a season of multiplication coming to your life. And I believe it is coming to this church. The Lord affirmed to me this morning in prayer, just in these altars, as I prayed for you and I prayed for this building and I asked the Lord to do a work today. He affirmed to me that there is something more coming, but we've got to get ready for it. We've got to get ourselves aligned. We've got to get ourselves to the place where we can be prepared to receive that which God has prepared for us. And in order to do that, we have to get our thinking realigned. We've got to get our, our mind in the right position. We've got to get ourselves refocused and get our focus off of the wrong things and get ourselves focused back on the right things. And so this morning, with the help of the Lord, I'm going to kind of continue to talk about the this seasons, the problems in life. And specifically, I want to talk about the reason for certain situations. And today I'm going to call this sermon, and this doesn't exactly have my title, but it's close enough. But I'm going to talk about this is only a test. Look at your neighbor and tell him this is only a test. Come on, help me preach this morning. If you want to get to the shower, you'll help me this morning. Tell them, tell your other neighbor, this is only a test. This is only a test. I want you to go to Genesis chapter 22. Very familiar story to most of you. I've preached it before, and I'm going to hopefully do it today with the help of the Lord. <clears throat> when you've got your word, I want you to say word. When you got it, it's going to be on the screen for you. But if you're like me, <clears throat> now somebody's got it. I heard them. If you, when you get it, say word. 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 All right, there's four. Word. Here we go. As T.D. Jakes would say, get ready, get ready, get ready. Here we go. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 22. Now it came to pass, and I'm sorry if this print is small. Now it came to pass after these things. <laughs> say after these things. That God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Then he said, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering and he arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship and we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son and he took the fire in his hand and a knife and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham his father and said, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. Then he said, look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, my son, God will provide. You believe that this morning? God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Then they came to the place of which God had told them. And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. This is only a test. Tell your neighbor it's only a test. As we look back over 2022, and look at all the events that transpired. If we're honest with ourselves, there are certain occasions that catch our attention. We can see certain events that truly stand out to us. There are certain seasons of blessing. Certain seasons where, or certain moments where things went just right. We had great memories that happened in 2022. Some of us got pregnant with our first child. Some of us experienced a new job. Some of us experienced financial provision. Some of us experienced some great things in last year. But 
when we look upon the last year of our lives, if we're honest with ourselves, there are other moments that rise to the forefront of our memory. And those moments are the ones that we know we cannot forget because those are the challenges that we faced. Many of us faced challenges in 2022 that we never would have imagined that we would have faced. We had to encounter hurdles that we never imagined that we would have had to have overcome. We faced problems, we faced difficulties that in our opinion we would have hoped we would have never had to face. And some of you unfortunately are still having to face those situations this morning. When we look back over the last year and assess the challenges that we endured, we find ourselves asking questions. We find ourselves looking back at the challenges, looking back at the hurdles, and if we're honest with ourselves, we ask, Ray, what was that? Anybody had any moments like that where you wonder, what was that? What was that? Why did I go through that? What was the purpose? What was the intent of that? Why did it come when it did? Why did it come to me? Why did this happen and what is this? What was that? Some of you are facing some what is that today. You're facing some this moments where you're thinking, what is the purpose of this season? What is the purpose of this trouble? Is there any reason why I'm going through what I'm going through? When I was preparing this sister Anita, I began to think of my last really two years, but mainly last year. And a lot of questions begin to arise as I assessed my last year going into my current year. Things, really difficult questions that many of you probably never would have thought to have asked and you may think be taboo, but I ask God questions. I ask him things because he knows I am finite. He knows that, that I am limited. And he knows, and he, let me just go ahead and tell you, God is not intimidated by your questions. He's not intimidated when you ask him questions where you get in danger when you start questioning who he is. You can ask God questions, and I ask God some questions. I said, Lord, I don't understand why my father at 47 years old had to get sick with cancer and die. I, Lord, I, I, I don't understand that. Explain, Lord, I, I, I need that explained if you can. Lord, I don't understand why my grandmother has lost two sons, her two oldest sons, almost 20 days, 20 years to the exact day of each other. Lord, I, I don't understand that. Lord, I, I, I'm, I'm grateful that Taylor and I conceived a child when we did. I'm grateful that I can look back at May of 2022 and say that we, while we received bad news May the 28th, that just a week after that in the first week of June, we received good news that we were going to have a child. But Lord, I don't understand why we had to wait as long as we did. Why did we have to get pregnant three times and lose the other three and then we get to keep this one? Lord, I, I, I don't understand. I'm making some of you uncomfortable, but I'm just telling you, God is okay with you asking him some tough questions. And I ask him the tough questions. And I look back over the challenges, Misty, and I thought, why did that happen the way it did? Lord, what was the reason for that? Why did it happen, how it happened, and when it happened? And why did it happen... To me. Now I'll be honest, when you look over the challenges of your life, sometimes they just seem coincidental. You think that was just a pocket of trouble that just happened. That's just life. It rains on the just and the unjust, and that's just part of living in a fallen world. But as I really assessed every situation, not, 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 not really just the minute problems. I'm not talking about the bad hair days and the day that my clothes didn't go the way I wanted to. That's just stupid stuff compared to the real stuff. I'm talking about the big challenges. I'm talking about the real trials that kept me up at night. And as I looked back over them, I began to see that they were not accidental, nor were they coincidence. I began to see that they had a purpose in their lifespan. That while I didn't understand it at the time, and while I didn't think they were fair, I began to realize that these moments were strategic occurrences that happened in my life for a reason. Each of them were purposeful. And I realized that each and every situation in their own way was a test. Every moment, every season, it was only 
a test. Look at your neighbor and tell them it's only a test. Everything I had been through, every situation was a test of me. It was a test of my faith, Misty. It was a test of my endurance, Jessica. It was the purpose of these testings were for, for them to prove that I am who I claim to be. That I am the one who believes God to be who he says that he is. That I am the Christian that I stand up here and proclaim to you that I am. These tests, these moments, these seasons were sent to me to see, do I really trust God as much as I preach about? Do I really believe God to be the God that I say to other people that he is? What I went through was a test. My this seasons were only a test. That thing that I wondered, what was that? God specifically said, that was only a test. Tell your neighbor, it's only a test. Let me just tell you this morning, the same is true for you. It doesn't matter what your this is this morning, it's only a test. It doesn't matter what problem you're facing this morning or what happened in your life, each situation was only a test. It was a test to prove your character. It was a test to prove you are who you say you are. Every this season you faced or are currently facing, it happened for a reason. It was only a test. Tell your neighbor it's only a test. Now, before I get into the crux of this, I want to talk about test because that word, I can go ahead and tell you, y'all are already uncomfortable and I love it. Because when I get you uncomfortable, I can actually get you to see the whole scope of everything that I'm trying to lay out before you. Because I know the word test makes you uncomfortable. How many of you are like me and you have test anxiety? I saw Holly. She's the teacher. Her hand went right up. <laughs> Don't torture those children anymore, Holly, with those tests. They've got it just like you do. But I have test anxiety, and I've had it ever since I can remember. If I ever knew we had a test the next day, I would be sick the whole night before because I was so worried about passing that test. Every time I've ever had to face or go and take any test, I, I, I would just be so overwhelmed and just so, my stomach would be so knotted up because I hate to take a test. And sometimes I believe that the tests were given by the teacher just to prevent me from moving forward. <laughs> I really believe that my 10th grade geometry teacher did that. That woman needed the Lord, and I pray she got saved. So, but the more I realize, and the, when we're honest with ourselves, and we think about tests, tests are not meant to prevent us. Tests are not meant to hinder us from moving forward. What tests really are is they are assessments to determine if you are able to move to the next level. What tests really are is they are assessments to determine if you have the sufficient knowledge to qualify for advancement. Tests are simply assessments to see if you are ready to graduate. How many of you when you took your uh, permit task passed the first time? Okay, I didn't. I took it three times. And let me tell you, after the first time when I failed it, Sister Sandy, they didn't hand me a permit. After the second time when I failed it, uh, Jessica, they didn't hand me a permit. It was only after the third time when it finally said, congratulations, you have passed, that they handed me my permit and I could drive my mom around. And that was the day that she got saved for sure because she wanted to make sure she was right with the Lord in case I messed up. What's the point? What am I trying to say? Every test is an assessment to see if, you're able, if you have the knowledge and have the ability to move on. And if you don't, don't expect to move to the next level. Come on, somebody. If you are not able to pass the test that's given to you, then God's not going to hand you the diploma and say, that's all right, do better next time. You're going to continue to go through the test that you're facing until God gives you the A+. Plus. Let me tell you, there are no C's. There are no C pluses. There are no B minuses. There are no B pluses. There are no A minuses in the kingdom of God. It is only a 100% grade. You don't pass with 95%. You've got to pass 100% when it comes to the test of your faith because once you pass the test there's something greater on the other side of that test that God has to get you prepared for. See let me tell you tests are to prove who you are. 
test our assessments to see how much you will obey and trust in the Lord. 1 Peter 4.12 says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. The word test means to examine and the word trial is a Greek word that means to pierce. Trials, the word piercing speaks of piercing a vessel to see what's on the inside of a vessel. Let me tell you, you will never know who you truly are until you're put under pressure. Come on, somebody. You will never know the true extent of your soul until you are put in a trial and you observe what is squeezed out. Let me tell you, I am suspect of anybody who has a, 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 a um, testimony without having gone through a test. Because without a test, your testimony is suspect. Without a test, you can tell me all day long, I'm a child of God and I serve God and I speak in tongues and whoa, I'm just all spiritual. But when you get under a test, I'm really going to find out who you are. Tests reveal the true contents of our soul. The pressures and the anguish of life will reveal the true person of who we are and cause us to take inventory of what's in our heart. Let me tell you, trials will cause you to come face to face with things you would otherwise avoid. Trials cause you to come to the realization that you might have an attitude that needs to be adjusted. Trials will cause you to realize that you might have a little anger problem that you need to lay at the foot of the cross. Trials may reveal to you that you don't trust God as much as you claim. It's all right, I'm going to keep preaching whether you amen me or not. Tests and trials are given to reveal the true state of your heart and to evaluate the level of trust and dependency that you have on the Lord. Why did I waste so much time telling you about a test? Because the scripture makes it clear that what the story we just read was a test for Abraham. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 22 and 1, now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham. Now, the word after these things is really profound because you would think everything that Abraham had faced thus far was a test. Because I know that if I had been told by the Lord, get up from your home, go to a land that I will show you, don't take anything with you but your wife and some animals, and I'm just going to show you where to go, and you have no direction, you have no clue, and you just have to start traveling. I know that I would think that was a test. I don't know about you, but if my nephew of my deceased brother was kidnapped in a military raid and was taken to be a slave and I had to take servants that didn't know how to fight and go and, and defeat a military to save my nephew, I know, Misty, I would think that was a test. Or I can tell you this, I know if I had to wait 25 years for my son of promise and the longer I waited, the older I got and I got to be 100 years old and there was still no baby and my wife's 90 and then she's past the age of childbearing and I'm wondering where the Lord is, I know that I would consider that a test. But all these things, it says after these things that God tested Abraham. Now you need to understand, you know the story, this was no small matter for Abraham. What Abraham was about to endure was no small test. No, this situation was hell on earth for him. See, we have the benefit of reading Abraham's story from hindsight. We have the ability to read the story all the way through and we know how it ends. But what we read as a test, Abraham experienced as a reality. What we, what we read as a story was what Abraham was facing. He was having to go through this valley and he didn't know that it was a test. He didn't know that what he was about to go through was God testing his character. It was God testing to see if he had Abraham's heart. Every test is about to see if God has your heart or not. The test of Abraham was to see if Abraham was as faithful to God as God was faithful to him. It was to see if he would trust the Lord no matter the cost to see if Abraham was truly the father of our faith. When we unpack this story, there are several lessons that apply to you and to me. And I'm going to unpack them real quick because it's 1145 and I don't want the women in the back to get mad at me. 
But when we look at the story of Abraham, there are several factors that we must consider. His test wasn't just one major test. It was a, it was a overall test with little test put within it. The first test that Abraham had to endure was the test of awareness. The test of awareness. In Genesis 22 and 1, it says that after these things that God tested Abraham and he said to him, Abraham. God called Abraham by name. This was not, I, I, I do not believe some theologians that say God prompted him. It was just a little feeling he had. No, I believe God spoke and he spoke audibly. And he said, Abraham. And how Abram, Abraham responded would determine whether or not he was sensitive and aware of the voice of the Lord. Do you know when God is talking to you? Do you know the voice of the Lord? Because see, here's what I find interesting. We expect the pastor to know the voice of the Lord. Oh, I'm meddling now and I'm making some of you mad, but that's okay. You got to love me to go to heaven. You expect me to hear the voice of the Lord, but you're okay being ignorant of it. You expect me to know when God is talking to me, but most of you would have no clue when he's talking to you. If you don't know when the voice of the Lord comes to you, if you are not sensitive to the voice of God, you will find yourself in a very precarious and dangerous situation because here's what you need to know. If you don't know the voice of the Lord, you risk missing your opportunity. There was a story of a little boy. His name was Johnny. And Johnny had this video game that he loved. And every day when he got home from school and every weekend that he had the moment, he would go up to his room, put on his headphones and play this video game hours on end. One Saturday, his mama was home and she thought, you know what? Johnny's been good. He's made straight A's this semester. I think I'm going to take Johnny shopping with me today. Let him get a few things and we'll go out for ice cream because Johnny loves ice cream. And his mama was getting ready and he was upstairs and she hollered up the stairs. She said, Johnny. I'm going to be ready to leave to go to the store in about 20 minutes. Why don't you put on your clothes and come with me? And there was no answer. She shrugged her shoulders because she knew Johnny sometimes just didn't answer back. And he was probably going to get ready because she knew at the moment ice cream was mentioned, Johnny was on it. About 10 minutes later, she screams up the stairs again. Johnny, I hope you're almost ready because I'm going to be ready to go in about 10 minutes. And we're going to go shopping. I'm going to take you to get ice cream. Still no answer from Johnny. So she gets ready and finally she gets ready to go out the door and she says, Johnny, I'm walking out the door. If you're not down here in two minutes, I'm going without you. Still no word, no sound from Johnny. So she tells her husband, I'm gone. I'll be back later. Several hours pass. She comes home and as she's walking in the front door, Johnny's coming down the steps and she's got this wonderful looking chocolate ice cream cone in her hand. And Johnny is just amazed. His eyes are as big as silver dollars because Johnny loves chocolate ice cream. And he comes down the stairs and he said, oh, mama, where did you get that chocolate ice cream? I want one of those. And she said, well, Johnny, I told you we were going for ice cream. You didn't get ready and come with me, so I didn't get you one. He said, well, mama, I, I, I didn't hear you. She said, well, tough, Johnny, I, I, I told you I was going out for ice cream. He said, but mama, I had my headphones on playing my video game, so I didn't hear it when you called me. She said, well, Johnny, I guess next time you'll learn to be more aware. And like any good mama did, she kept eating her ice cream and kept walking on to the kitchen. <laughs> What's the point of the story? Because Johnny was distracted by something else. Yeah. He missed his opportunity. Oh, shatala bobo sata, I feel the Lord. Because Johnny was distracted and was listening to other voices. He missed his opportunity for something Great. What am I trying to get across to you? If you are not sensitive and if you are not careful, you will miss it when God calls your name. And if you get caught up in distraction and get caught up listening to all of the other voices, then you'll miss it when God says, Abraham. You'll miss it when God calls your name. See, our problem today is, you want to know why we don't hear the voice of the Lord like the saints of old did? It's because we're so distracted by other garbage. Oh, I feel like meddling and I'm about to meddle good. We're so distracted by our friendships 
by our hobbies, by our cares, our worries, and our concerns of life that we just say, God, give me a minute, and either we're not sensitive enough to the voice or we ignore him altogether. Go ahead, clap for him. I... They may never throw us a shower again. We're so caught up listening to Fox News, CNN, the Chicken Noodle Network. What's going on on the hill? What's going on over in Bruton? What's going on in Montgomery? What's going on in the, in the office gossip column? And we're so worried listening to everything else. We are insensitive to the voice of the Lord and we don't hear it when he calls our name. We have missed so many opportunities because we've been ignorant or we've ignored the voice of the Lord and because we've not listened to him, we haven't been able to go where he's going. Let me tell you something. God help me stay on track this morning. When God is ignored, he'll put you through something to get you back to listening to him. We saw the perfect example of it in the NFL this past week. Damon, what's his name? Damar, whatever his name. The Lord knows his name. I know his first name's Damar. That boy fell, fell dead on the field of a massive heart attack. In 20 minutes, they had to perform CPR. And guess what happened? The same people who said, you can't kneel on a field and pray, every one of them jokers had to eat crow and pray for a boy because God got their attention. I wish I had a jacket to throw. I'd throw it now. God was sick and tired of being ignored. And so he let something happen to get them back on their faces before the Lord. And let me tell you, God showed up in that young man's life. He's off of life support and he's talking today. I'm here to tell somebody, and I hope this messes up your theology because it messed mine up. What you're going through is God trying to get your attention. He's sick and tired of you ignoring him. He's sick and tired of your TV shows taking precedence over time with him. He's sick and tired of scrolling on that little idiot box on Facebook and TikTok and Instagram. He's sick and tired of that taking precedence over spending time with him. So he's letting you go through something so you'll learn what it's like to hear the voice of the Lord again. Oh my God. I'm about to tear this place apart. If Abraham was going to be all that God had for him to be. He said he would be the father of many nations. If he was going to be the father of many nations, he had to pass the test of awareness. If we're going to be who God wants us to be, and if we're going to go where we want God to take us, we have to pass the test of awareness. We've got to know when the Lord calls our name. We've got to be, in, we've got to be intentional about listening We've got to learn to shut down everything else and give him time to speak. God wanted to see if Abraham could pass the test of awareness because in order for God to take him where he wanted him to go, he had to be able to hear his voice. You have to know when God is talking to you. Otherwise, you may miss your opportunity. Look at somebody and say, it's only a test. It's only a test. The second thing it was is it was a test of availability. Hmm. <laughs> I'm about to make some folks mad. See, God wasn't just testing Abraham to see if he would hear. He was testing Abraham to see if he would heed. He wasn't just testing to see if Abraham could hear the voice of the Lord. He was testing to see if Abraham could hear his voice and respond. Y'all ain't catching what I'm putting down. If God wants to use someone, he has to find somebody who's available. I didn't say able. We have confused ability with availability. 
Let me tell you, you can be the most gifted singer, most gifted speaker, most gifted whatever, but just because you're gifted don't mean God can use you. He's not looking for somebody who has giftedness. Yes, God will gift you for your calling. But you can be gifted and still be unavailable to be used by the Lord. <laughs> we think availability, Ray, is being, having our schedule freed up. We think what availability to the Lord looks like is I have nothing else to do. So Lord, whatever you want to do, I'll do it. No, God is looking for intentional availability. He is looking for availability that says, God, I know I've got this going on, but you told me to do it, so I'll do it. God, I know that my schedule's packed, but you spoke, I heard, and I'm going to heed, and it doesn't matter whatever else is going on, I'm going to give you my yes. See, what it means to be available to the Lord is it means to give him a yes without knowing all the details. What it means to give the Lord a yes, it means to give him a yes and be available not knowing what's in it for you. Oh, see Abraham, when he's heard the word Abraham, he said, here I am. When you look at that in the Hebrew, that is the word hinani, H-I-N-E-N-I, -E hinani, and it means, Lord, here I am. What would you have me do? I'm at your service. He said, here I am, Lord, whatever it is you need me to do. I don't know what it is. I don't know the details. I don't even know if there's anything in it for me. But, Lord, you spoke. I heard, and I'm going to heed. He not me, Lord. Here I am. That's the kind of church that God is looking for. That's the kind of servants God is looking for in his kingdom. He's looking for somebody that will hear the voice of the Lord, and when he speaks, they'll say he not need here am I what can I do for you yes. see our problem today we've got too many yeses with strings attached yes. Come on. if God says I need a pastor I need a youth pastor. I need somebody to do the announcements. I need a music pastor. I need somebody to be up front and center. We'll say, oh Lord, here I am. Use me. But when God says, I need a Sunday school teacher. I need a children's church pastor. I need a door greeter. I need a parking lot attendant. I need somebody to clean my house. We go silent. Oh, yes. We have put such a premium on the spotlight and applause and accolades that we're willing to tell God yes as long as it, we get blessing out of it. But God is not looking for a conditional yes. He's looking for somebody that'll say, Lord, I'm available. I'll do what you want to do. I'll do what you need done. I don't need nothing from you. I just want to serve. He not me. Here I am, Lord. I'm available to whatever you want to do, and I don't need nothing out of it. We get so caught up in saying yes to the Lord, but saying, Lord, as long as there's something for me at the end of what you asked me to do. God is sick and tired of us playing games with him. You hear me. You want to know why we have seen revival hindered? We've got too many chiefs and not enough Indians. Oh, I said that. We've got too many people looking for the applause and the accolades of the pulpit. Honey, if you want it, I'll give you the microphone. It's not all that it's cracked up to be. What you see me do here this morning is about 5% of my job. But the other 95% is going and laying beside the bed of a dying saint as she draws her last breath and the family's asking why. The other 95% of my job is walking with families through sickness that they don't see a way out of. The other 95% of my job is worrying about are we going to be able to pay the lot bill? Are we going to be able to do what God has us to do? 5% of my job is the applause and the amens but we think that's all it is Lord I'll let you use me as long as I get some appreciation and some recognition 
That's not what it means to be available to the Lord. God is looking for some people who are intentionally available. You want your schedule to free up for God to use you? Okay, he'll send you a test. Because how many know nothing will free up your schedule like a test? Everything else fades in comparison when you're needing God to do something in your life. It was a test of awareness, but it was a test of availability. He was seeing if Abraham would be available and respond to his call. See, God is testing your availability. He is testing you to see how you will respond to his call. And how you respond will determine what he does in your future. It was a test of availability. Tell somebody it's only a test. Third thing it was is it was a test of alignment. In order for Abraham to experience the incredible provision that God had waiting for him, he had to align himself with the will and the purpose that God had for him. This meant separating himself from things and people that would hinder him in his journey. See, when Abraham started his journey, he started it with him, his son, two servants, and a donkey. But when he got to the base of the mountain, he told the servants, you stay here with the donkeys. Me and my son are going yonder to worship. What does that mean for us? Abraham understood. His servants were not meant to travel the entire journey with him. He understood that there came a place in his climb where he had to separate himself from people that could not go where he was going. Oh, I hope you hear what I'm saying this morning. They would not see the incredible provision. They would not have the mountaintop experience. What you need to understand is that your journey will, with God will be filled with exit ramps where people can leave. During some of the greatest struggles last year, some of you had people leave you. I'm not talking about death. I'm not talking about circumstances you couldn't change. I'm talking about people who left you intentionally. Familiar faces became distant memories. Those people that said, you can count on me. Those people that said, I'll be there with you through thick and thin. When you needed them, they were nowhere to be found. We experienced that when my father died. We had all these people around. Oh, we're, we, we we're here if you need us. The day he drew his last breath and the day that we said amen at the funeral, every one of those voices went silent. We had people said, pick up the phone and call. Every time we called, they had something else better to do. That hurts. Let's be honest. That stings. When the people we thought we could count on leave us. But let me tell you, some people may have left you, they may have hurt you, but I'm here to tell you today it's okay. It's okay that they left you. You didn't need them anyway. Oh. It's okay that they left you. It's okay that they abandoned you. It's okay because the reality is they had to leave in order for you to go where God was taking you. Too many people can become a hindrance in your pursuit of what God has called you to do. Too many people can become heavy baggage on your climb up the mountain to God's provision. So let me set somebody free this morning. Some of you are crying over people you lost. You're upset over relationships that died out. But I'm here to tell you, quit crying and start thanking God because he got you out of that relationship because he knew it was no good for you where you were going. I wish I had a better amen than that because I have experienced what it is to give the gift of goodbye. There's some people can't go where I'm going. They're not called to where I'm called and that's okay. I'm going to go whether they go with me or not because my purpose is great enough to where I'm willing to leave some people behind. Some of you need to quit going back to some relationships God got you out of. 
Hallelujah, Brother Drake. That's good preaching. Thank you. I'm going to keep going if you don't mind. Quit fooling with that stupid boy that ain't man enough to treat you like the woman that you need to be. He's no good. He's not husband material. Let him go. Quit fooling with that little girl who can't keep herself pure and keep herself chaste before the Lord. You don't need that girl. You need somebody who is there to serve the Lord and who can go where you're going. Leave them alone. Quit fooling with that friend that's always negative and that never can see what God has in store for your life. Quit calling her up. Quit calling him up. Let them go. Leave them with the donkeys and ascend and go and worship. What you need to understand, in order to ascend, you've got to learn to separate. When you ascend, your circle will get smaller. I have fewer friends now than I've ever had in my entire life. And there's really only two within that circle that I know I can trust with anything. Because the higher you go, the smaller your circle gets. Because not everybody understands the purpose God has on your life. Not everybody can see the vision God has for where he's taking you. See, we need to learn. In order to ascend, we've got to learn to separate And let me tell you, there's a difference between separation and alienation. Alienation is when they leave you. Separation is when you say, what God has for me, Sister Anita, is too good for me to keep hanging out with people that hinder me, so I'm willing to let them go. I'm willing to let them go on my own. What did God tell his people? Come you out from among them. I heard Floyd LaHan, who's a great healing evangelist, he told Perry Stone, and some of you may know who he is, and I've always remembered this. He said, if you want to see more of God, you've got to spend more time with him and less time with people. I'm a people person. Imagine how hard that is for me. I love to talk. I talk in my sleep. And sometimes God don't always talk back. But Sister Sandy, I had to learn. Not everybody can go where God's taken me. Not everybody is equipped. Because let me, let me, let me say this and I'll move on and I'll, I'll finish up. They're not called to where you're going. And you need to learn that because if they're not called to where you're going, they can't handle what you find when you get there. There was, I'll tell this story and I'll move on. When I was a teenager, and these people right here will vouch for me, we were all in church together. There was a group of four of us. We were the four musketeers. I won't say their names because they may watch. I don't know. And all four of us, we had this dream, Ray. Two of us were going to be the preachers, and the other two were going to be the singers. And we were going to get us a tent, and we were going to go, and we were going to have revivals, and we were going to see healings. We were going to see miracles. We were going to see God move, and we would always shout in church, and we would just, we would just tear that place apart, Kena. But when the rubber hit the road, can I tell you the only one left in ministry is me. Why? Because my pastor put the brakes and said, hold on. You need to understand what you're asking for. You need to understand where you're going. And the other three couldn't hang. Why? Not saying they weren't called, but because they couldn't go. I'm no better than they are. But God had a different purpose and a different plan for my life than what he had for them. Did it hurt losing them? Absolutely. Because let me tell you, when you lose some people, the enemy will convince you that you losing them is an example of your failure. But don't you listen to that lie. All it is is an example. God has something greater for you. And when God prepares you for greatness, he will start weeding out all the other people that can't go where you're going. If you want to experience the call God has for your life, you've got to learn to give the gift of goodbye. Yeah. Abraham had to learn the test of alignment. He might have wanted the servants to go with him, but they couldn't go where he was going because they weren't unprepared to face what he was about to face. 
Your test, your this season is about God aligning you with his will and removing people from your life that didn't need to be there anyway. Look at somebody and tell them it's only a test. It's only a test. Abraham's test was a test of awareness. It was a test of availability. It was a test of alignment. And the last thing it was, it was the test of the altar. The, this portion of Abraham's test was the most critical of all. It was the climax of the situation. His test of the altar was the test to see if he would trust God with his most precious possession. The Bible says that when they came to the place that God had told him, Abraham built an altar and he placed the wood in order and he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. This promise he had waited for, this precious commodity, if God didn't move, was about to die. Now, let's just go ahead and be honest. When you read this story from a fleshly perspective, you think God's morbid and Abraham's a whole lot of crazy. Because you're reading this story and you're thinking, what kind of God would ask a man to sacrifice his son? And what kind of man is crazy enough to obey a God that would ask such a thing? Come on, be real this morning. It's crazy. But when you read the story through the eyes of faith, and when you know your word, you will find that what was going through Abraham's mind was he was not looking at this situation as some morbid murder, but he was looking at this situation as another opportunity for God to perform the miraculous. Because in Hebrews chapter 11, 17 through 19, it says, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called. Listen to this. Concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead from which he also received him in a figurative sense. What Abraham saw was an opportunity for God to let his miracle working hand move once again. His son was conceived a miracle and he knew that if God required him to sacrifice his son, God was good enough and he was God enough to perform a work he had not performed before and raised his son from the dead. Abraham believed God. He trusted God with what was most precious to him. And he knew God could be trusted. Do you trust God with that which is most precious to you? Can I tell you that the greatest blessing and the greatest breakthrough you'll ever experience is when you can say, God, I trust you enough to lay that which is precious to me on the altar. How do I know? Because for three and a half years, Taylor and I had to lay that which was precious to us on an altar. We had to say, Lord, you know the desires of our heart. You know we want a child. You know we want that individual, that child to raise them up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. You know that, God, we want to bring life into this world. But, God, we can't do it without you. God, we can't do it without your help. So, God, we're laying that need on the altar. We're laying that which is precious to us on the altar and we're believing God that no matter what happens, even though the situation looks bleak, even though it looks dead, God, we have faith in you that you are good enough and you are God enough to resurrect that which is dead and perform a work on our behalf. Yes, Abraham trusted God with that which was most precious to him. Can I tell you this morning you can trust him? Hear me this morning. You can trust him with every need. You can trust him with your children. You can trust him with your finances. You can trust him with your marriage. You can trust him with whatever it is you have this morning. God is faithful. He is trustworthy. He has always come through. He's never failed and he never will. God is a faithful friend who sticks closer than a brother and his power is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all we can ask or think. Give him praise this morning, if you will. Yes, 
You may have lost some things this year. But let me tell you and let me remind you, there is still resurrection power in the hand of the Lord. Some things may have died out this year. Some dreams may have died. Some desires may have died. But our God is able to raise up that which has died and restore all things unto you and make your life like the life of Job. Your latter can be greater than your former and he can bless you with everything that you lost. Yes, yes. Can I tell you, you can trust him with whatever you lay on the altar. Yes. Abraham trusted him. And he knew God was trustworthy and faithful. Although he had no knowledge of how the situation would play out, he demonstrated total faith and trust in God. He laid his promise on the altar and he made preparations for him to die. And as he raised the knife in his hand, the angel of the Lord spoke. The angel of the Lord said, Abraham, Abraham. And Abraham once again, he not me, here I am. What do you want, Lord? And he said, don't lay your hand on the lad. <laughs> oh, I'm, oh, I hope you're going with me. Don't do anything to him. For now, I know. For now. Now I know. Abraham, you walked through this test not knowing what was coming. You had to let some people go. You had to walk through this test worried about what was going to come out. But you followed me all the way to the end. And now... I know. Let me tell you, when you have faith in God enough to lay what, that which is precious to you on the altar and to stay with him even when you don't understand, to stay with him even when it hurts, to stay with him even when it don't seem fair, there is a voice from heaven that says, now I know. You might have lost some people, but now I know. You might have experienced some hurt, but now I know. You might have not understood what I was doing in the moment, but now I know. Now now I know you are who you say you are. Now I know you trust me like you say you trust me. Now I know that you fear me and that I have your heart. Now I know. See, Abraham's faith and obedience proved to God that Abraham was willing to follow him no matter the cost. And look at this, and I'm, I'm going to say this and I'll be done. Because of his willingness and because of his faith, God provided the substitute sacrifice for Abraham's son. Verse 13 says, Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. And he took, say he took, come on, say he took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. Because Abraham trusted God and because he had faith in God's ability God tied up his blessing for him he tied up his blessing for him so that when Abraham got to the place God could give him that which he had prepared. Hear me this morning. God has your blessing tied up for you so when you get to the place you can take it. God has your blessing tied up and caught up and it ain't going anywhere. Nobody else is going to take it. It's got your name on it and it's tied up waiting on you this morning morning. Your healing is tied up this morning. Your provision is tied up this morning. Your miracle is tied up this morning. Whatever you're asking God for, it's tied up and it's waiting on you. Give him praise this morning. And here's the last thing I'll say and Mr. you can come on and play. God tied his blessing up, but it required more faith on Abraham's part. Why? Because Sister Betty, it said that when he saw it was tied up, Abraham took the ram. It didn't say God took the ram and laid it on the altar for him. No, Abraham had to go and take that which was provided for him. God will tie up your blessing for you, but you've got to be the one to take it.
God will tie up your miracle. He'll tie up your healing. He'll tie up your provision. But you've got to be the one to go out and grab it and take it. Matthew says the kingdom of God suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. What am I telling you this morning? Through Jesus Christ, every need we have has already been provided. All we've got to do is reach out and take it. If you need healing by his strength, stripes, you have been healed. Reach out and take it. If you need provision, it says that he gives provision to all the children who trust and call on the name of the Lord. Reach out and take it. If you need deliverance, it says that I heard, I called out to the Lord. He heard my cry and he delivered me of my affliction. All you have to do is reach out and take it. Yes. All you got to do, whatever you need this morning, you just got to reach out and take it. Reach out and grab it. God's provided it for you. All you've got to do is take it. Look at somebody and tell them, take it. Take it. God tested Abraham. And he tested him for one reason and one reason only. To see if he still had his heart. He tested him to see if he would still hear his voice. If he was still aware and sensitive to when God was speaking. He tested him to see if he'd be available to when he called. He tested him to see if he would align himself with his will. The next thing he would test him with, the last thing is he would test him to see if he would follow through and then accept that which was provided for him. This morning, your test is worth for one reason and one reason only, to assess your readiness to what is coming next in your life. It's to see if you're still aware, see if you're available, to see if you will align yourself and to see if you will follow through and take the provision that God has provided for you. God is testing your faith. And he'll tie up your blessing for when you pass the test. But in order to get the blessing, you have to first pass the test. There is an after this to your season. But in order to get to the after, you must pass the test of this. But remember, it's only a test. It's only a test. Stand with me this morning, Brother Eddie, or somebody can go shut the video off. Taylor, go shut the video off if you don't mind. Here's my altar call this morning, and this is what I feel like we need to do. One thing God has been really dealing with me with is Yes, I believe in altar calls and I believe getting out of your seat to come and receive that which God has for you. But I believe God is about to do such a miraculous thing in our church.